Welcome to the second part of the Making a Messiah series, this one dealing with Old Testament interpretation. If you have not yet seen part one, I encourage you to watch it first and return to this video afterwards. As we saw in the previous video, very little is known about the New Testament authors, except for what we find in their own writings, which cannot and should not be trusted as accurate autobiographies. It has been shown that the authors of the New Testament got some fairly significant details wrong in their stories, and this video will illustrate how they interpreted and even distorted Hebrew scripture to support their beliefs. For any kind of a persuasive case to be made for Jesus Christ being the awaited Jewish Messiah, there would need to be Old Testament references and prophecies identifying him. The New Testament authors realized this and so incorporated many quotations of scripture along with their writings. But some of these quotations interestingly differ from what the Old Testament actually says. One example is found in Romans 10 verse 11, which reads, As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. The NIV Bible has no footnote for Romans 10:11, but the only Old Testament passage that really resembles the quotation is Isaiah 28:16. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who trusts will never be dismayed. You may notice that the verse says nothing about trusting in him, and in fact, certain translations like the New American Standard translate the last part of verse 16 to read, He who believes in it will not be disturbed. I am no Hebrew scholar, but I don't know of any common practice of referring to a cornerstone with a masculine pronoun anyways. Another example of this creative interpretation method is in Hebrews 10.5, where the author quotes Psalm 40, verse 6. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. The Hebrew Masoretic text has a very different ending, though, saying nothing about a body, but stating instead, My ears you have opened. Yet in all fairness, the author of Hebrews probably quoted from the Greek Septuagint text, which does include the part about the body. However, it should be worth noting that regardless of translation, Psalm 40 verse 6 is speaking of a sinner, not a perfect Messiah. Later in verse 12 it reads, My sins have overtaken me, and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head, and my heart fails within me. In another act of theologically motivated text revision, we find Paul argue in Ephesians 4, 7-8 that to each one of us grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, When he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave, gave gifts to men. Paul quotes from Psalm 68, 18, but changes one significant detail. Unlike his rendition of gave gifts to men, the original text says received gifts from men. What gifts could Christ receive from us? Paul's misquotation seems to conveniently support his beginning statement that to each one of us grace has been given. But the inerrant word of God couldn't possibly have been tampered with by the men who wrote it, could it? In John 7.38, Jesus says that whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. No such verse exists in the Old Testament, however. Luke 24, 46-47 states that he, being Jesus, told them, This is what is written, The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. But once again, there is nothing in the Old Testament about the death and resurrection of Jesus, and especially more important, there is never any reference or prophecy of the Jewish Messiah dying or being resurrected at all. When Jesus and his disciples pick grain on the Sabbath and are charged by the Pharisees with violating the Mosaic Law, Jesus reminds them of a passage which says that even though the temple priests profane the Sabbath, they are still innocent. Of course, Jesus wasn't a temple priest, but there's also no such verse in the Old Testament. Now some believers might protest that even though some of the New Testament authors were kind of lazy in their quotations of the Old Testament, it doesn't prove that deception or sinister motives were involved. While this may be true, it is interesting to note how many other quotations those same authors get almost word for word. In Ephesians 6, 2-3, Paul includes Deuteronomy 5.16 in practically flawless form. Romans 11, 9 through 10 quotes Psalm 69, 22 quite faithfully, only rearranging things slightly with no change to meaning or context. 
And once again, we find a fairly accurate quotation of Isaiah 6, 9 through 10, and Matthew 13, 14 through 15. Why does it seem as though the misquotes typically occur when they suit the author's purposes? The Apostle Paul had a particularly unique interpretation of the New Covenant mentioned in the Old Testament, too. According to Christianity, God initially gave his people the law, which was made up of the so-called five books of Moses, which are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The law was provided as the means for salvation. By following a set of moral precepts, the children of Yahweh would gain favor in their Lord's eyes, and blessings would be bestowed upon them. However, many of the most questionable moral teachings are contained in those five books, including execution of homosexuals, execution of those caught in adultery, and compulsory marriage of rape victims to their rapists, with no possibility of divorce. Fortunately, in Jeremiah 31:33, God reveals that he will institute a new covenant after some time, and it would be a renewal of the terms or laws under a new contract. Paul seems to get a bit carried away with this idea of the new covenant, though. Nowhere in the Old Testament does it say that God will completely dissolve his old covenant and replace it with a new one, and Jesus specifically stresses the importance of the Mosaic Law in Matthew 5, 17-19, but Paul clearly preaches against it in several of his epistles. In Romans 10, 4, he even goes so far as to say that Christ is the end of the law. He teaches violations of the food law in Romans 14.14, 14, the seventh-day Sabbath law in Colossians 2.16, and the circumcision law in Galatians 6.15, just to name a few instances. He calls the law a curse in Galatians 3.13, and ministry of death that condemns men in 2 Corinthians 3, 7, and 9. This is in stark contrast to the Old Testament's mention of the law as being perfect, that it lasts forever, and that it is the delight and salvation of God's people. It's not difficult at all to see that Paul was no fan of the Old Covenant. His hatred for the Mosaic Law may have motivated him to fudge some details in order to present the New Covenant as a full replacement for the Old One. If Paul was capable of defying his own Messiah's admonition of violating the law, there is no telling how capable he might have been at distorting stories and events so that he could establish his Messiah as the end of the law and the new easy road to salvation. For as Paul said himself in Romans 3, 5, If our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? Christians will often claim that the Hebrew scriptures contain prophecies or references to Jesus, but what they so frequently seem to miss is how simple and easy it would have been for the New Testament writers to have just modeled their Messiah on the Tanakh, which they were certainly somewhat familiar with. Followers of any influential figure or cult leader are well known to do their part in exaggerating the greatness and impact of the one they revere. People are lying about Jesus even still today. If you're a Christian, the odds are good that you don't believe Joseph Smith spoke to Jesus, and you may reject the Pope's claim to divine authority. The New Testament authors did make many attempts to connect the Old Testament to their Savior, but they misquoted some references and apparently made up others, which is not uncommon for any group sincerely following and worshipping a central figure. In the next part of this series, we will look at more of these Old Testament references, specifically noting how the authors of the New Testament attempt to classify Jesus as the Messiah. There are more than a few holes and omissions in their case. But until then, thanks for watching, and please rate and or comment if you enjoyed this video.